Hey, what is up, everyone? Tyler Ramsey here back with another live stream. We're gonna do some more Active Directory hacking today. Specifically, we're gonna work on enumerating AD. Now, just to recap where we've been, we started with the breaching AD room, which is getting those initial credentials for Active Directory. We completed that network on Try Hack Me, and today is kind of the second part of enumerating AD. And the way it works is if you're attacking Active Directory, the first thing is to get credentials. Even if they're low level credentials, you get an access point so you can authenticate to the Active Directory. And then from there, you kind of enumerate, you try to figure out what groups are there, what users are there, what the password policy is. Just adjusting my headphones. There we go, much better. So we're gonna work on enumerating AD today. If you missed the first part, you can catch it on my YouTube channel. Uh, you can find my YouTube channel right here on Twitch. Otherwise, you may be watching this after the fact on YouTube. Either way, welcome. It is truly an honor to have you hanging out with me. And what I always like to say, especially in the beginning, and I'll say it throughout the stream, I do not claim to be anywhere near an expert. I am learning right alongside of you. So if I do something silly, which I guarantee you I will, or if I do something that's totally inefficient, please call me out. I am here to learn, and hopefully we can stumble through this room together and we can learn more about Active Directory, enumerating, pivoting around, and it's gonna be a fun time. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. There we go. And I'm gonna pull up Twitch on the side just so I can monitor the chat. What up, Hunter Bot? Good to have you here. And so we're picking up right where we left off. So before we got the stream started, what I did is I booted up my Kali Linux machine. I got connected to the enumerating AD network on Try Hack Me. I re-downloaded my configuration file, reset up my DNS. If you're following along for the first time, I would encourage you to watch part one where I walk through those initial steps. You need to do that first before you can connect to this network. And then you actually generate creds. Uh, you wouldn't normally generate creds, but it's kind of like we completed the first room of breaching AD. So we always have these low level credentials. So I generated my creds and I used SSH and got logged in on the domain. We are officially Bradley Cook. So apparently Bradley, uh, he fell for our phishing email or something and we got his credentials. So we are Bradley Cook. We finished off last time with enumerating through command prompt. And this time we're going to do some enumeration through PowerShell. And as always, if the audio sounds off, if the music sounds off, feel free to call me out. Let me know because I can't tell if it's off or not. And finally, one last thing. If you're on our Work Smarter Discord, you can also join me on there if you want to ask questions over the voice chat. And while I'm thinking of it, I am just going to check Discord here and kind of advertise it. It's a cool spot. I've talked about it enough times. Maybe I'll do an, a more fuller introduction to it later. But if you're not on here, you should join us on Discord. It's a great place to learn and to hang out. All right, PowerShell. PowerShell is the upgrade of Command Prompt. Microsoft first released it in 2006. Well, PowerShell, oh, before we get started, guys, I do have sad news and I want us to take a moment of silence. Today marks the death of the great Internet Explorer. Uh, it, reading about Microsoft made me think of Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer back in the day had the market share of web browsers and it has died since Internet Explorer makes me think of GeoCities and Angel Fire and all those old uh, old website builders and just ghetto type things when it comes to Internet Explorer. But today, June 15th, I believe at what, is it 27 years old? Internet Explorer has officially passed away. So let's have a moment of silence. All right, we had our moment of silence for Internet Explorer. <laughs> so let's dig into this. All right, PowerShell. Microsoft first released it in 2006. It is alive and well, unlike Internet Explorer. While PowerShell has all the standard functionality Command Prompt provides, it also provides access to commandlets, pronounced commandlets, which are .NET classes to perform specific functions. While we can write our own commandlets like the creators of PowerView did, we can already get very far using the built-in ones. I've never wrote my own commandlet. I just Google stuff. I use PowerShell all the time in my, in my day job. Since we installed the ADR set tooling in task three, uh, I may have to RDP and reinstall that. I bet I'm gonna have to. Um, we'll try it anyways. If it doesn't work, we're gonna have to RDP into the machine and install it that way, but that'll be good because you'll be able to see that process. 
since we installed it, blah, blah, blah. And I'm actually installed the associated commandlets for us. There are 50 plus commandlets installed. We'll be looking at some of these, but refer to this list for the complete list of commandlets. Yes. Microsoft Docs is actually super helpful when it comes to learning or utilizing PowerShell. And that's what that's linking to, of course. So users, let's see if we need to go into, um, it actually doesn't matter if it's case sensitive, but ah, we got our RDP in. Let's just do that real quick. And one of the ways you can do that is a program called Remina. You can also use X free RDP, I think, but I use Remina. And we need to grab the IP for our jump box, which is going to be 10.200.49.248. And just know that if you're doing this on your own, your IP is gonna be slightly different. Okay, and we are Bradley Cook. I don't remember Bradley's password. Here it is. Let's just copy that beast. Let's get our password in there. Our domain is za.tryhackme.com. We'll just save the password, okay. And we got it. So let's go ahead and go on here. And we're gonna go, oh, is it already here? Somebody already installed it, right? That's what it looks like to me. Let's just make sure it's configured. Yep. It is, so I should. Why don't I have that? Oh, I'm not in PowerShell. <laughs> let's try this. There we go. New mistake there. Okay, we do have it, perfect. Let's jump back into it. PowerShell, we can use the get AD user commandlet to enumerate AD users. And this is showing kind of how we can do it. This is similar to the net, uh, net user that we used in command prompt. So we'll just show you how this works. Get dash AD user. You have to specify the identity, which is like their name. So it says Gordon Steven, we'll just follow with the example. And then dot server instead of slash domain. Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. We should probably specify that, right? So that's going to be our domain, za.tryhackme. We want properties and the wildcard for all. Uh, so he must not be an account. They must be using him as an example. So let's just use our own account because we know that Bradley Cook exists. So let's enumerate ourselves real quick. There we go. So if we do that, we can see a few different things. We can see when the account expires. We can see if the account's delegated, all this good stuff. Um, we can see when it was created. Uh, we can see, we should be able to see if it's locked out. And you can use this as kind of an information to figure out what privileges your account has. We can see what groups they're a part of, uh, when things were changed, created, all that good stuff. The parameters are used for the following identity, the account name that we're enumerating, properties, which properties associated with the account will be shown. The asterisk will show all properties. That's kind of like a wild card. And dash server, since we are not domain join, we have to use this parameter to point it to our domain controller. For most of these commandlets, we can also use the dash filter parameter that allows more control over enumeration and use the format table commandlet to display the results such as the following a lot more neatly. So let's go ahead and give that a shot. Get ad user filter name like, and we're gonna do our own. We'll do cook. And then we're gonna do dot server, za.tryhackme.com, which is our domain controller or domain format table. Whoops, this is gonna give a much cleaner look. And then it's going to say, what do you want for your table headers? And we want name, Sam, account name, dash A. What did I miss? Get any user filter name like cook, server, category, info, parser error. I typed something wrong. Huh. What did I type wrong? Get AD user dash filter, 
name. I see, I caught it. Let me back up a little bit. I think it's this right here. Yep. There we go. So we see all the cooks. We got name and Sam account name just in a much nice, cleaner thing. If we were doing a real uh, pen test or hacking, we would take a screenshot of that so we could include it in a for information. We can also use the get ad group commandlet to enumerate ad group. So let's go ahead and do that. That's kind of like the net group command for just regular command prompt. So get ad group identity. I'm guessing we do administrators. Yeah, that's what I figured. Administrators, our server, za.tryhackme.com. Any other switches that they want us to do? Nope. And there we go. So we can see our administrators, the level that it's at, the object class. We can also enumerate group membership using the git ad group commandlet. So let's give that a shot, git. And I should show you guys something. Um, I don't think it will work on here because I'm SSH'd in, but if you're ever working in PowerShell, come on. So if you do like git process, you can do that. But if you want to know like what you can all do for it, if you do git process, um, is it help? Jeez, I'm like blanking on this. Is it get help? Yeah, get help. And then you can do get process. And then is it online? It will open your browser. Yeah. So then you can open the Microsoft Docs right there in your browser so you can look at it while you're going through PowerShell. Helpful, just a little trick in mind. I like to look at it online just because it's formatted better. And then you can look at it alongside of what you're doing in PowerShell. But okay, back to this. Get AD group member. Identity, are we looking at administrators again? Yeah. Administrators. Come on. This is the downside of when I'm using my other screen for Twitch. Server za.tryhackme.com. And there's going to show our different groups that are part of that administrator. So we got our domain admins, our enterprise admins, Vagrant and administrator ad objects a more generic search for any ad objects can be performed using the get ad object commandlet for example if we are looking for all ad objects that were changed after a specific date so we're going to set a variable called change date come on connection get our new object, date, time, year, month, I take it, 28, 12, 0, 0, 0. Do that right. And now we're going to do get ad object. We're going to do a filter on it. And it looks like we're filtering it by when changed. Then we're gonna grab our variable we just made. Change date, include deleted objects. Server, I'm guessing za.tryhackme.com. So it's showing us what groups are created on that date, I believe. Let's see. If we wanted to, for example, perform a password spraying attack without locking out accounts, we can use this to enumerate accounts that have a bad password count that is greater than zero to avoid these accounts in our attack. A lot of times with AD, it's after like five invalid attempts, the account gets locked for a certain specified time. So you of course wouldn't want to password spray an account that has already four, you know, incorrect attempts because the real user actually forgot their password. So that'd be get AD object filter bad password count GT zero 
server za.tryhackme.com. And so we're looking at these are all the ones who have um, bad password account that's greater than zero. So if we're doing password spraying, we want to avoid these accounts specifically, right? That's helpful. This will only show results if one of the users in the network mistyped their password a couple of times. Domains, we can use the get ad domain to retrieve additional information about the, spe about the specific domain. Let's go and give that a shot. Get ad domain server ca.tryhacking.com. Okay, so we see computer containers, deleted objects, distinguished names, domain controllers, DNS, forest information. Cool. Altering AD objects. A great thing about the ADRSAT command list is that some even allow you to create new or alter existing AD objects. However, our focus for this network is on enumeration. Creating new objects or altering existing ones would be considered AD exploitation, which is covered later in the AD module. I bet the next room, they're, they're releasing one AD network a week, so I bet next week it'll be AD exploitation, and I assure you we will dig into it and learn then. However, we will show an example of this by force changing the password of our AD user by using the set AD account password commandlet. Okay, so we're gonna use our account that we have access to, set AD account password, identity, specify our account, bradley.cook, server, ca.tryhackme.com, old password, convert to secure string. This is so it shows asterisks as plain text, old, force, new, password, convert to secure string as plain text. And I understand I could copy and paste this, but I think it's good to type it just so it helps you learn some of the syntax there. Force. Okay, I typed it wrong. Oh, I spelled Bradley Cook wrong. Look at that. You guys probably caught that if you're watching that. Bardley Cook is probably not the correct name. Let me jump back and fix that real quick. How about Bradley.cook? Nope, still did it wrong. The specified network password is not correct. It didn't give me a chance to specify the network password. Okay, I just said not to copy and paste, but I wanna copy and paste this. I just wanna see if I missed something. Cause it should prompt us after we do this. Whoops. It should prompt us after we do this to type in the old password and then type in the new password that was what we specified. So let's just try it this way. If this doesn't work, I'm assuming their command's wrong and I don't really care. So what they're telling you to do apparently does not work. I copy and pasted it. See if I'm missing anything. The specified network password is not correct. Old password convert to secure string as plain text. Old. Whatever. The PowerShell commandlets can enumerate significantly more information than the net commands from command prompt. We can specify the server and domain to execute these commands using run as from a non-domain join machine. We already practiced that in the last video, the last session. We can create our own commandlets to enumerate specific information. And we can use the ADRSAT command list to directly change AD objects, such as resetting passwords or adding a user to a specific group. Drawbacks, PowerShell is often monitored more by the blue teams than command prompt. And we have to install the ADRSAT tooling or use other potentially detectable scripts or PowerShell enumeration, such as like powerup.ps1 would be one example. What is the value of the title attribute of Beth Nolan? So I think there'd be git ad user identity. See if I can do this from memory. Beth.nolan server ca try hack me.com. Oh, maybe I need to look elsewhere. What is the value of the title attribute? Oh, 
let's try that. Title, senior, there we go. So we just need to specify the properties there. What is value of the distinguished name attribute of Annette Manning? So similar command, but instead of the wild character, we should be able to specify that specific attribute. So let's go and type in Annette Manning. And then for properties, let's do distinguished name. What is the value of the distinguished name attribute? Is it looking for th this? Let's see. Oh, it's looking for that whole string. Got it. At least I'm pretty sure that's what it's looking for. There we go. When was the tier two admins account created? So this would be git ad group. I don't think it's identity. Let's see what it is. Okay, get ad group, we're gonna do filter. Oh, so we do do identity, get ad group, identity ad group. Okay, sounds good. So get ad group, identity, the group is tier two admins, tier two admins like that. And we wanna know when it was created just looking through up here, partition properties. I don't know what the property called for when created. So let's just do the wild card. And when created right there. So is this called when created? That is the property we could have specified to narrow that down a little bit. What is the value of the SID attribute of the enterprise admins group? Okay, so similar thing. We're gonna change the identity though to enterprise admins. And we're looking for the SID. Let's just try it this way. Boom. Which container is used to store deleted AD objects? Which container is used to store deleted AD objects? Okay, get ad object, that's what we're looking for. So get ad object. And let's look at let's look at the help for that. Okay. So get ad object, identity, ad object. So if we do identity deleted, maybe? Which container is used to store deleted AD objects? What's the hint say? Use get AD domain. Oh, okay, and review the information. So if we do, what if we do get AD domain and properties? And what was that like light command that we did up here? So if we do something like, is it filter? So if we do get ad domain and we do like filter, I don't know if that'll work. We might just have to review this. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there's a way quicker way to do it, but 
deleted objects container. Is that all we're looking for? Let's see. Which container is used to store deleted AD objects? I, I think this is all we're looking for. Boom. All right, let's jump into Bloodhound. Download task file. So let's just go ahead and open this on our Kali Linux box. Get a drink of water. Maybe. Come on, Cal or not Kali. Come on, try to hack me. I think when I set the domain controller as my DNS, it tries to route things through there first. And obviously it's not there, so it just goes a little bit slower. Okay, let's download our task files. Let's just make sure we get those. Yeah, let's close Remina. And is it the BH session inject? I'm assuming that's what we want. So let's grab that. Let's put in home, Cali, try hack me, enumerating AD. And let's go there ourselves. And unzip it. Oh, we got a bunch of .json files. That's probably to load into Bloodhound, I would assume. So lastly, we will look at performing AD enumeration using Bloodhound. Bloodhound is the most powerful AD enumeration tool to date, and when it was released in 2016, it changed the AD enumeration landscape forever. Bloodhound history. For a significant amount of time, red teamers and unfortunately attackers had the upper hand. So much so that Microsoft integrated their own version of Bloodhound in its advanced threat protection solution. It all came down to the following phrase, defenders think in lists, attackers think in graphs, unknown. Bloodhound allowed attackers, and by now defenders too, to visualize the AD environment in a graph format with interconnected nodes. And it's really neat. Um, we'll see it, but it's, it's pretty dang cool. Each connection is a possible path that could be exploited to reach a goal. In contrast, the defenders use a list, like a list of domain admins or a list of all the hosts in the environment. This graph-based thinking opened up a world to attackers. It allowed for a two-stage attack. In the first stage, the attackers would perform phishing attacks to get an initial entry to enumerate AD information. This initial payload was usually incredibly noisy and would be detected and contained by the blue team before the attackers could perform any actions apart from exfiltrating the enumerated data. However, the attackers could now use this data offline to create an attack path in graph format, showing precisely the steps and hops required. Using this information during the second phishing campaign, the attackers could often reach their goal in minutes once a breach was achieved. All right, they already had it mapped out. It is often even faster than it would take the blue team to receive their first alert. This is the power of thinking in graphs, which is why so many blue teams have also started to use the types of tools to understand their security posture better. Introducing Sharphound. You will often hear users refer to Sharphound and Bloodhound interchangeably. However, they are not the same. Sharphound is the enumeration tool of Bloodhound is what you get the loot with. It is used to enumerate the AD information that can then be visually displayed in Bloodhound. Bloodhound is the actual GUI used to display the AD attack graphs. Therefore, we first need to learn how to use Sharphound to enumerate AD before we can look at the results visually using Bloodhound. I think they already gave us all this Sharphound loot, but okay. There are three different Sharphound collectors. Sharphound.ps1 is a PowerShell script for running Sharphound. However, the latest release of Sharphound has stopped releasing the PowerShell script version. This version is good to use with rats uh, since the script can be loaded directly into memory, evading on disk AV scans. Sharphound.exe, a Windows executable version for running Sharphound. It gets picked up by AV. Azure Hound.ps1. PowerShell script for running Sharphound for Azure, which is Microsoft Cloud Computing Services instances. Bloodhound can ingest data enumerated from Azure to find attack paths related to the configuration of Azure identity and access management. Cool. When using these on an assessment, there is a high likelihood that these files will be detected as malware and raise an alert to the blue team. 
This is again where our Windows machine that is non-domain join can assist. Interesting. We can use the run as command to inject the AD creds and point sharp hound to a domain controller. Since we control this Windows machine, we can either disable the AV or create exceptions for specific files or folders, which has already been performed for you on the THM Jump One machine. You can find the Sharphound binaries on this host in the tools directory. We will use the sharphound.exe version for our enumeration, but feel free to play around with the other two and we will execute Sharphound as follows. Okay, we already have the loot though. Okay, well let's do it anyways. Let's go ahead and open up our shell. Clear. And let's go to C, tools. Now, if it wasn't already here, you could set up a Python web server on your attack machine and send the file over that way. And there's a bunch of bloodhound.zip. And I think because this is a shared network, this is other people's loot that they've already kind of thrown on here. I think that's where we're seeing that from. So here's what we're gonna run. Sharphound.exe, collection methods, and then methods. Well, what's the method that we want? We execute sharp pound as follows. We don't actually do that, do we? Exclude DCs. Well, I mean, that isn't, usually you do that because it's specifying like you should put something there, but <laughs> let's just try it. I don't think it's gonna work this way. Yeah, I didn't think so. The command sharphound.exe was not found, but does exist in the current. Oh yeah, duh, because I'm in PowerShell. Option collection methods has no value. Well, what value do we need to give it? Container group, specify the domain to enumerate, search for stealth, add an LDAP filter. It doesn't tell us which one it wants us to use. Parameters explain collection methods determines what kind of data sharp pound would collect. The most common options are default or all. Oh, I see. So to do all or to do default, do we just do collection methods, default is default. So why do I have to specify it? Can I just leave that part off? And it will be default. If I leave that switch off, I don't know. Yep. Okay, anyways. Also, since Sharphound caches information, once the first run has been completed, you can only use the session collection method to retrieve new user sessions to speed up the process. And domain, here we specify the domain, of course, we want to enumerate. In some instances, you may want to enumerate a parent or other domain that has trust with your existing domain. You can tell Sharphound which domain should be enumerated by altering this parameter. Okay, cool and exclude DCs. This will instruct Sharphound not to touch domain controllers, which reduces the likelihood that the Sharphound run will raise an alert. You can find all the various Sharphound parameters here. It is good to overview the other parameters since they may be required depending on your red team assessment circumstances. Using your SSH PowerShell session from the previous task, copy the Sharphound binary to your AD user's document. It's direct. Oh, I wasn't supposed to run it there. <laughs> I got ahead of myself. It would appear other people got ahead of themselves too. So um, let's go ahead and copy sharppound.exe and we're gonna copy it to home directory documents. And let's go to that. There it is. Okay, 
There's sharppound.exe. We will run sharppound using the all and session collection methods. Okay, so basically what we just did sharppound.exe collection methods all domain ta.tryhackme.com and then exclude DCs, I think. See if I remember that correctly. Yep. Let's give that a shot. Sit back and enjoy it. Let's keep reading while this does its thing. It will take about one minute for Sharp Hound to perform the enumeration. In larger organizations, this can take quite a bit longer, of course, even hours to execute for the first time. And honestly, most organizations' Active Directory is an absolute mess, so that makes sense. Once completed, you will have a timestamped zip file in the same folder you executed Sharp Hound from. I bet we can use SCP to copy it to our attack machine. We can now use Bloodhound to ingest the zip to show us attack pass visually. Why did we, why did they include it all though? That this is all the stuff. Oh well. Um, as mentioned before, Bloodhound is the GUI that allows us to import data captured by Sharp Hound. At least I'm pretty sure it's all the same stuff. Maybe we can check it out. Yeah, there's the bloodhound.zip. And this is called BH session inject. Maybe it's slightly different. Well, let's just SCP it. SCP is a way you can transfer files if you have an SSH connection. And I always have to look up the syntax. Whoops. Come on, stupid spam stuff. So here's what we want to do, SCP and our file, which is that one right there. And then our remote username, and we'll do Cali. Then our IP of our attack machine, 10.50.47.35. And then where we want to save it to, and we can just save it to home slash Cali. And let's see if that works. Oh, I don't have SSH started on my um, Linux machine. I think you just start SSH. Uh, open SSH, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I see. Let's just go ahead and do that as good practice, even though I don't think we really need to. Should already be on there, right? Maybe not. Okay. Okay, it is already installed. Um, try to regenerate keys. So let's go ahead and edit it. We're gonna change a few things on here. This is all just a lab, so I don't care that much about security. So if you're planning on using SSH briefly, defaults are probably fine. If they use for length of time, I recommend a minimum enabling public key authentication, then disabling password authentication. No, we don't need to do that. And honestly, I want to allow... Oh, you know, the other way we could do it, instead of messing with this, we can just do it the other way, where we connect to SCP from here um, omitting the file name, if SSH and the remote host is listening, and that's that's kind of how we want to do it, I think. No, to copy directory from local to remote system. From local to remote. Copy remote file to a local system. It's remote username. Here's kind of what we want to do. Let's try this. SCP Bradley, I don't remember his name, to be honest. Bradley Cook. So SCP Bradley dot cook at whatever this IP is for this jump box. Be that. And then can we go like that? 
we go to our shell, and grab the name of that file. Like that, and if we just save it to this area, will this work? Okay, so far so good. O-N-S-L-4845. It worked. And so we don't com get confused, let's make a directory called Bloodhound. And let's move that to Yeah, there we go. Good work. What up, Air Jones 42? I don't know who you are, but good to have you here, good sir. Let's see. Okay, let's let's jump down here. So we use SCP, we drag that over there. I don't remember where we're actually at. Maybe right here. As mentioned before, Bloodhound is the GUI that allows us to import data captured by Sharphound and visualize it into Attack Pass. Bloodhound uses Neo4j as its backend database and graphing system. Neo4j is a graph database management system. If you're using the attack box, you may, we're not, don't use the attack box, use your own Kali machine. In all other cases, make sure Bloodhound and Neo4j are installed and configured on your attacking machine. Either way, it's a good to understand what happens in the background. Before we can start Bloodhound, we need to load Neo4j. If you have Kali Linux, it should, it should be here, okay? So we're gonna do Neo4j requires, oh, we need to start it, obviously. Let's try that. Argument, unmesh argument. What do you mean? Start. Start. Oh, start server. Oh, you just do this. Whoops. <laughs> I can't, I can't spell y'all. There. I think that's all we had to do. Give it a second to start. And then, once that gets started up, we should be able to launch Bloodhound. And then we'll connect to it. Let's give it a shot. Bloodhound. What do I need to type for... Launch Bloodhound. Bloodhound no sandbox. Do I really not have it installed? I assumed it was loaded by default in Kali Linux. I must be wrong, so let's give it a second to install. And you know what? I think this might be a good time for a five minute break. Oh, Shelby, what up, Shelby? Good to have you on Twitch with me, sir. All right, let's go ahead and take a five minute break while this installs and we'll be back in five minutes. So get up, walk around, get a drink of water, do something. We'll be right back.
Hey, what is up, everyone? Welcome back. Hopefully you got up. Hopefully you stretch and you're ready to do some more hacking. Believe it or not, we're already one hour in. We got one more hour to go. And let's see if we can knock out this room. Let me get Twitch pulled back up just so I can monitor the chat. And we got Bloodhound pulled up. Oh, I should probably share my screen as well. There we go. All right, got my screen shared. Dive it back into a Bloodhound finish installing. Let's go ahead and try to launch that. Bloodhound dash dash no sandbox. Boom. I believe it's Neo4j and Neo4j for username and password. Let's give that a shot. We need a change from the browser first. All right, let's follow the instructions and do what it tells us to do. Turn the music down just a tad here. All right, database, connecting Neo4j. So gonna prompt us to change the password right away. Still connecting, new password. Let's call it password one, two, three. Very, very secure. Make sure you use that for your password for all your accounts, including your bank account. Password one, two, three, change password. Will it allow us? Yeah. Okay, Neo4j, password, one, two, three, and let's save it. Log in, success, awesome. And we're gonna load our JSON files in here. To import our results, you will need to recover the zip file. We did that to use SCP command. We did that, we're already ahead of the game. Once you provide your password, drag and drop. All right. Come on, Bloodhound, I believe in you. Are you gonna open? Maybe, maybe you're gonna open, maybe not. Okay, whatever, we can do it this way too, I believe. So if we go to, we don't wanna to connect to a cloud, would it be database? This is like Azure, use database, properties, Let's close this out. Um, maybe we do need to do this. So I don't know how to upload it here. But Bloodhound obviously doesn't feel like working. Let's just try to reload Bloodhound real quick. Make sure it actually closed. Perfect. Bloodhound. Dot dash no dash sandbox. There we go. Now we can upload our files, which is right over here. I believe it's uh, upload data. And let's go ahead and navigate to our data here. So we want to go to home. We don't want root though. Come on. Can I just, there we go. That's what I'm trying to do. We, it's in our Cali one, try hack me, numerating AD, bloodhound. And here they all, I think I can upload the zip actually. Let's try it. Can I? Maybe? Yeah, just taking some time. Apparently there's no data in the users one. I don't know why, but everything else seems to be working. It's clear finished. Okay, now we should do an, is it analysis? Yeah, so if we do find all domain admins, look at that, it's gonna show us the different domain admins. There's some really cool stuff he can do here. Um, if we scroll down through here, we can find what's uh, shortest path to domain admin, I believe. Like, what if we do that? Oh, no. How about shortest path to domain admin? There we go. So, if you see this, it's showing us what we can log in as. 
and and the shortest path i mean it says what exactly what it says but you can imagine how useful this would be if you're planning an attack and like they said on that second fishing attack you already have everything in place that as soon as you get access you have a plan to jump through before the blue team can stop you uh, once all json files have been imported we can start using bloodhound to enumerate attack paths for this specific domain attack paths there are several attack paths that bloodhound can show pressing the three stripes next to search for a node will show the options Oh yeah, so we already did that. So that's database info, node info. So it's down here showing what they're talking about. Know that if you import a new run of Sharp Pound, it would cumulatively increase these counts. First, we will look at node info. Let's search for AD account in Bloodhound. You must click on the node to refresh the view. Um, how do I search for it? Also note you can change the label scheme by pressing, because I don't, for some reason it pull users in. I don't know if you guys caught that. There should be users here. But for some reason it didn't pull it in. I wonder if we go to, what happens if I upload the data that I grabbed from um, from the room. Sorry, I was thinking. If we go try hack me, a new brain AD. There was this BH session inject. What's this? And this one has users. I wonder why is R didn't, ours didn't have users. May just be an error with the actual room. And maybe that's why they provide this as part of the room over here, like a file that you can download because maybe there's issues with when you grab it the other way. So if we clear when finished here. Now, if we go here, we do like analysis. Can we change the domain here? We have two sessions, relationships, users. Oh, Azure objects, we don't have any of those, but that'd be cool if we did. Do we change target node here? No. Can we change what settings? Nope. I think this is partly broken. Because once again, it's not showing anything for users here, and it should be. Because that's how they're getting this node info is from users. Just seeing what it all shows. Am I going to need to access this? Yeah, probably. Sweet. I might have to figure out how to fix it then. So if we do analysis, if we do like shortest path from... Kerberos users. Now we're seeing some of them. Let's close this. So we're seeing some of these service accounts. How come we don't have any users there though? Well, I don't know. Let's just keep reading and seeing if we're actually going to have to go back and try to fix that. Scroll down, scroll down. Attack pass. There are several attack pass that Bloodhound can show. Blah, blah, blah. Note that if you we read that, we can see there's a significant amount of information returned regarding our use. Each of the categories provides the following information if we could actually get our node info to work. Select a node. Oh, okay. So that's how we do it. Oh, here's Henry Miller. How do I search though? You can change the label scheme. You must let's search for AD account on Bloodhound. You must click on the node to refresh the view. Do we need to click like domain users? What if we go like that? Take a long time to render. No, let's not do that. I want to search for a specific user. 
filter? Maybe not. Oh, do I just type it? Is it that easy? What's my username? Bradley Cook. <laughs> yeah, I'm overthinking this. So, how if we go like that? So I have it here. How do I get to work? Search for AD account and you must click on the node to refresh the view. I'm clicking it. It's not refreshing the view. Not making that up. It does when I click down here, but when I click that one, it doesn't work. Oh, well, whatever. Overview provides summary information such as the number of active sessions the account has or if it can reach high value targets, that would be helpful. Um, let's just go to the one that we did have. I saw one user here, because then we can see these node properties, right? Um, node properties shows blah, 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 extra properties, provides more detailed ID information such as distinguished name, group membership, local admin rights, execution rights, whether or not they can RDP, outbo outbound control rights, information regarding AD objects, inbound control rights, provides information regarding AD objects. Cool. If you want more information in each of these categories, you can press the number next to the information query. For instance, let's look at the group membership associated with our account. No, I can't because it doesn't work. But we can look at it with this one. So if we get this, it says that this person is a member one of tier one admins and domain users. Um, we can see that our account is a member of two groups. Next, we'll be looking at the analysis queries. These are queries that the creators of Bloodhound have written themselves to enumerate helpful information, which is what I was looking at first. Under the domain information section, which is right here, we can run the find all domain admins query. And that's administrator, tier zero admins. And here's a user, T-O tiny screen. So the T zero admins have the T zero before their names. Good to know. Uh, note that we can press left control to change the label display settings. Okay, I see, cool. These icons are called nodes, All right? We can zoom out on here. And the lines are called edges, all right? Makes sense. Let's take a deeper dive into what Bloodhound is showing us. There's an AD user account with the username t 0 Green. That's that guy right there. But is a member of the group tier zero admins. But this group is a Nessa group into the domain admins group. Right there meaning all users that are part of the tier zero admin groups are effectively DAs. What up, Weaponize? Good to have you again. Furthermore, there's an additional AD account with the username of administrator, it's right there, that is part of the domain admins group. Hence, there are two accounts in our attack surface that we can probably attempt a compromise if we want to gain DA rights, right? That one or that one. Um, uh, since the administrator account is a built-in account, we would likely focus on the user account instead, right? Phishing emails, any type of way we can steal that account. Each AD object that was discussed in the previous task can be a node in Bloodhound, and each will have a different icon depicting the type of object it is. If we want to formulate an attack path, we need to look at the available edges, remember that's these things, between the current position and the privileges we have and where we want to go. Bloodhound has various available edges that can be accessed by the filter icon. Ah, I see. Just kind of glance through these. There's the can RDP, can PS remote, which is kind of like SSH with uh, PowerShell. I use it all the time at work. We got SQL admin, there's Azure. That doesn't really matter to us because we don't have Azure hooked up here. These are also constantly being updated as new attack vectors are discovered. We will be looking at exploiting these different edges in a future network. However, let's look at the most basic attack path using only the default and some special edges. We will run a search in Bloodhound to enumerate the attack path. Press a path icon to allow for path searching. 
the heck is a path icon? This? What's the path icon? I'm assuming that, right? Hopefully. Our start node would be our AD username. Oh, I see. This is almost like Google Maps <laughs> for hacking, right? Let's do this. That's our start node. Okay. And blah, blah. It's going to be our AD username. And our end node would be tier one admins. Okay. Oh, that is cool. There's us, Bradley Cook. We're part of domain users. We can RDP, you see that? We can RGP to the jump box, which makes sense. From the jump box. Oh, and on the jump box has an active session by Henry Miller, who's a T1 admin, so it's showing us our attack path. We need to use Bradley Cook to RDP into the jump box and then take over this active session of Henry Miller. And now we just made a pivot. This is, this is cool stuff. I don't know if you guys are excited as I am, but usually when I do Bloodhound, it doesn't work. So this is neat to actually see it working. Our start node would be our AD username, blah, blah. If there is no available attack path using the selected edge filters, Bloodhound will display no results found. However, in our case, Bloodhound shows an attack path. It shows that one of the TA admins account broke the tiering model by using their creds to authenticate the jump box, which is a workstation. It also shows that any user that is part of the domain users group, including our AD account, has the ability to RDP into this host. We could do something like the following. Use our AD creds to RDP, look for a privilege escalation vector on the host that would provide us with admin access. Using admin access, we can use credential harvesting techniques and tools such as Mimikatz. And since the T1 admin has an active session, our cred harvesting would provide us with the NTLM hash and we could use hashcat and then we can pivot to Henry Miller's account. This is a straightforward example. The attack pass may be relatively complex in normal circumstances and require several actions to reach the final goal. If you are interested in the exploits associated with each ed, the following Bloodhound documentation provides an excellent guide. Let's just glance at this. Admin two, okay, so it's just saying uh, how you would get this depending on what, what the edge is. And this cool dude explain it to us. I need a monitor like that. Cool stuff. I'll have to check that out later. I'm going to leave it open. Um, it is worth the effort to play around with it and learn its various features. And one thing I would encourage you to do in my Oracle VirtualBox, I set up my own domain control. I have a little Active Directory lab here. And uh, you can make your own AD lab, and then you can do this without going to jail, which is always recommended, or do try Hack Me Rooms. But when you have your own AD lab, it teaches you how to set up Active Directory, how to um, set up a domain controller, how to promote a server to a domain controller, how to spawn other servers. John Hammond on YouTube is doing a series on this right now. That's how I set up my little AD lab there, but that's local on my computer. Session data only. The structure of AD does not change very often in large organizations. There may be a couple of new employees, but the overall structure of OUs, groups, users, and permissions will remain the same. However, the one thing that does change constantly is active sessions and log on events. Since Sharphound creates a point in time snapshot, that's important, a point in time snapshot of the AD structure, active session data is not always accurate since some users may have already logged off, like Henry Miller may have already logged off, or other users may have established new sessions. This is an essential thing to note and is why we would want to execute Sharphound at regular intervals. A good approach is to execute Sharphound with the all collection method at the start of your assessment and then execute it at least twice a day using the session collection method. Okay, so that gathers the sessions. This will provide you with new session data and ensure that these runs are faster since they do not enumerate the entire AD structure. Um, this will blah, blah, I got distracted. The best time to execute these sessions runs is at around 10 o'clock when users have their first coffee and start to work and again around 1400 when they get back from their lunch breaks but before they go home because their sessions are active you can clear stagnant session data and bloodhound on the database info tab by clicking the clear session information before importing the data from these new sharphound runs so benefits to bloodhound it provides a gui for ad enumeration 
It has the ability to show attack paths for the enumerated AD info, and it provides more profound insights into AD objects that usually require several manual queries to discover. Drawbacks, it requires the execution of Sharphound, which is noisy and can often be detected by AV or EDR solutions. This is the problem we were running into on the throwback network. We had to actually log in as a local admin and disable Windows Defender because it kept picking up our Sharphound. And you can ask Nate all about that when he streams the fun throwback network. All right. What command can be used to execute sharphound.exe and request that it recover session information only from the ZA.tryhackme domain without touching domain controllers? That's the no DC, right? I don't know what it's all looking for. Oh, so it's looking for the full command. So we would do, let's just pull up notepad. And look at it this way. Make it way smaller just so we can see the text we're looking for. Right, so it'll be sharphound.exe. And then collection methods, I think. Is it like dash collection methods? And just session information. So I'm guessing it'd be collection methods, sessions. There's a server. We might have to look at the syntax. Go way up. Zoom out a little bit. Oh, dash dash collection methods. I was close. And then I think it would be sessions, right? Domain za.tryhackme.com and we would exclude DCs. Let's give that a shot. Oh my goodness, wall of text. Hey, apart from the KRBTG account, how many other accounts are potentially Kerber Roastable? Let's check that out. Let's give Kelly Linux the space it deserves. There we go. So the way we would do that is we would go to analysis. We can probably turn that off and we want to look for Ker... Ker I always mess it up. Kerber Roastable. Ker okay, whatever. We're just going to pretend like I said it right. What are we looking for? Other accounts that we can Kerber roast. How many other accounts are potentially Kerber roastable? Let's put this away. One, two, three, four, five. Do we have any of these? We have this one. We got the creds for this one in the first box. This is the McAfee one where we cracked the password. Five, right? Huh? Ah, one, two, three, four, five. What am I missing? Oh, apart from it, so four. I was counting it. How many machines do members of the tier one admins group have administrative access to? I don't know. Let's see if we can figure that out. So would we do like, how would we find that? How many machines do members of the tier one admins group have admin access to? Search for the tier one admins group and enumerate this information. I never figured out how searching worked. <laughs> well, what if we run this? Because he's in the tier one admins group. Okay. Group membership, local admin rights, execution rights, inbound control. What's owns? Oh, these are just the accounts. That's not what we need. It's not like two, is it? Oh, it is. It must be that. Oh yeah, see, we have that one and that one. How many users are members of the tier two admins groups? Well, so I'm not gonna refresh. No data return from query. What if we go tier one? 
Um, what if we go administrators? Does that pull it up? Tier two admins. How many users are members of the tier two admins group? Um, direct 15. Hey, we got it. Conclusion. Enumerating AD is a massive task. Proper AD enumeration is required to better understand the structure of the domain and determine attack paths that can be leveraged to perform privilege escalation or lateral movement. Additional enumeration techniques. In this network, we covered several techniques that can be used to enumerate AD. This is by no means an exhaustive list. Here is a list of enumeration techniques that also deserve mention. LDAP enumeration. Any valid AD cred pair should be able to bind to a domain controller's LDAP interface. This will allow you to write LDAP search queries to enumerate information regarding the AD objects in the domain. Power view. Power view is a recon script part of the PowerSploit project. Although this project is no longer receiving support, scripts such as PowerView can be incredibly useful to perform semi-manual enumeration of AD objects in a pinch. Windows management instrumentation, WMI can be used to enumerate information from Windows host. It has a provider called root directory LDAP that can be used to interact with AD. We can use this provider in WMI and PowerShell to perform AD enumeration. We should also note that this room focused, typo, on enumerating the structure of the AD domain in its entirety, instead of concentrating only on identifying misconfigurations and weaknesses. Network hurt, my neck hurts. Enumeration focused on identifying weaknesses such as insecure shares or breaks in the tiering model will be discussed in future rooms. Mitigations, blue team stuff, which is what I do for my job. AD enumeration is incredibly hard to defend against. Many of these techniques mimic regular network traffic and behavior, making it difficult to distinguish malicious traffic from normal traffic. However, there are a couple of things we can do to detect potentially malicious, malicious behavior. Number one, powerful AD enumeration techniques such as Sharp Hound generate a significant amount of logon events when enumerating session information. Since it executes from a single AD account, these logon events will be associated with this single account. We can write detection rules to detect this type of behavior if it occurs from a user account. Number two, we can write signature detection rules for the tools that must be installed for specific AD enumeration techniques, such as the Sharphound binaries and the ADR set tooling. Three, unless used by employees of our organization, we can monitor the use of command prompt and PowerShell in our organization to detect potential enumeration attempts from unauthorized sources. On a side note, the blue team themselves can also regularly use these enumeration techniques to identify gaps and misconfigurations in the structures of the AD domain. If we can resolve these misconfigurations, even if an attacker enumerates our AD, they would not be able to find misconfigurations that can be exploited for privilege escalation or lateral movement. Now that we have enumerated AD, the next step is to perform privilege escalation and lateral movement across the domain to get into a suitable position to stage attacks. This will be covered in the next room. I understand, I understand, complete. We did it. We completed the second AD network. The first one was breaching AD. We completed enumerating AD. Good job, y'all. Um, before I sign off, I don't think I'm gonna start a new box. Oh, look, I broke into the 7,000s. I'm still in the top 1%. I'm slowly leveling up. Cool. I wanna show you guys something neat. At least I think it's neat. When it comes to Windows hacking, this is kind of a freebie. One good way, if you're doing a Windows box, something I always do is I run system info. You can actually do this on your own machine. So if I run system info, I'm logged in as Bradley Cook. Access denied, I can't run system info as Bradley Cook. Well, isn't that just lame? Um, let me try to... You can usually do this on a CTF. Apparently they have it locked down on here. I might do it for my own computer. Okay, let's do it for my own computer. I'll show you guys how this works. System info. There we go. 
And basically you take, when you're doing like a CTF, you can just copy all this. Oh, I'm in terminal, so I may have to control shift C. Copy all this. I hope it copied. We can close Bloodhound now. And we can just do this in, we'll just do this base folder because I'll delete it. Let's G edit and we'll just call it system info.txt. I'm gonna paste that in, perfect. And then I think, I don't know if it's on here, is it Windows? I think it's Windows Privilege Suggester. Let's see if we can find it. This is a new Kali Linux install that I have, so I don't have my normal tools on it. Windows Exploit Suggester, it's a Python script. It's, it's pretty dang, dang cool, that's so why I wanna show it to you guys. Windows Exploit Suggester, let's go ahead and grab this. We'll just do raw. Come on. Control LS G edit Windows exploit suggester dot pi paste and now change mod make it executable. Oops. Um, look, at, look at the help. I'm trying to remember what it is. So first we have to generate a database. Yep. So we're going to go ahead and run it with dash D. Maybe. Let me look at the help again. The file. That, oh, no, we just need to generate it. We don't, we don't do it now. How do you generate the database? Feed an output file, database requires show use to determine. Uh, gosh. Because we, we'll be able to eventually do that. It's a dash I. Please apply a database with the database or deflag. Okay, update, that's what I'm looking for. Now we're getting there. It's going to download a database of all the current Windows exploits that can be used. My computer should be pretty well patched, so I'm not sure what it's going to find. But basically, it compares the system info to this database and says, here are some exploits that might work for privilege escalation on this box. So we have that in there now. So now if we do that, dash D, and then we're going to grab that database like this. And we'll see if my host machine is exploitable. Oh, it can't determine the Windows version. I wonder if that's because I'm running Windows 11. Well, maybe it's not set up for that yet. Let's try OS text and Windows 11 64 bit. Maybe it's not set up for Windows 11 yet. I've never tried it with Windows 11. Nope, it's not gonna work. And I don't feel like logging into a box to do it. Well, it's just one. I was gonna demonstrate to you guys that tool, but apparently I can't without doing an actual CTF and I don't feel like pulling a CTF, but it's a cool tool. If you are doing a Windows CTF, probably not as useful for Active Directory type stuff, but for just a CTF, a single box that you're hacking, it is super useful. At least I found it useful. But hey, I think I'm gonna call it. Uh, er, I'm gonna call it a night a little bit early. We're like 30 minutes early, just because I don't want to start something new in the last 30 minutes. Tomorrow night, we might take a break from Active Directory, and we'll just do some legit boxes. So I think I might change it up, and we'll do Hack the Box, and we'll see if we can knock out a few machines on Hack the Box tomorrow night. And as I do them, I'll just walk you through my entire methodology from enumerating with nmap to researching vulnerabilities to using Metasploit to popping reverse shells. And I'll just kind of walk you through the process and I'll go into it blind as well. So I'll do boxes I haven't done before and you guys can stumble through them with me. And if you have a Hack the Box subscription, you can boot it up and you can do it with me. I may also do Try Hack Me. I'll pick one of them, but I would encourage you to do it alongside of me. I will be live again. To, I think I'll be live tomorrow. Yeah, today's Wednesday. So I am live. Is it Sundays, 
Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. So I'll be live one more time tomorrow, and then Nate will be on here Friday, Saturday, and Mondays is when he's live. So I'm going to call it a night. Once again, I want to thank you guys for joining me for this stream. And if you haven't joined Discord, join Discord. If you don't have me on YouTube, look me up on YouTube. Just go to YouTube and search for Tyler Amsby. Subscribe to me on there. Watch those videos, comment, and uh, support us. We appreciate your guys' support. So once again, thank you for joining. And I will catch you guys, hopefully, tomorrow night. Peace.